Um, yeah, g'day. My name's Brad Fisher, and I dairy farm with my wife Karen and four children at Meningi, South Australia. Uh, Karen is currently at home, uh, home in her home in Sweden with the kids. Uh, she's going to hate it that I use that photo of me and her. <laughs> so I'm a third generation dairy farmer, where both my grand, with both my grandparents and parents, historically ran a 650 cow Holstein herd in an irrigated pasture base uh, dairy farming system. Uh, we farm on the lower lakes making us one of the final dairy farms on the River Murray system. Uh, at the end of 1997, I returned home after high school. Uh, in 2000, I, uh, that's going to be 2000 anyway. Um, <laughs> in 2000, I was awarded the Warakiri uh, Dairy Scholarship at Marcus Oldham College, and so I went there to study agribusiness administration knowing that this would be a skill gap that uh, best suited the family business. In 2002, I packed up my bags, grabbed my passport and headed overseas. Firstly, uh, I went to Canada, milking 75 cows in a barn system for about 12 months. And while working there, I met a Swedish bloke who was from a family-run farm in Sweden. Uh, I was travelling around Europe, doing a, looking at a few things for, I don't know, it was only a couple of weeks, I reckon. I was sick of living out of a backpack. Uh, so I rang him up and said, can I come to a few weeks' work for you in Sweden? It was silage time and ended up staying there for about 18 months. Um, yeah, milking about 400 cows, all in a barn system as well. Uh, while working there, that's where I met my Swedish wife, Karen. So after two and a half years away, we headed back to Australia. Uh, 2005, I took over management of the dairy at home. Uh, this time, my father and I could see further gains being made if we moved away from our traditional pasture-based system. As such, we began planning, planning our move into a PMR, TMR system. Uh, we were spending a lot of resources into growing and maintaining pasture on a farm, on farm, but with 650 cows grazing this pasture, I just hated seeing the wastage left behind uh, in the paddocks. It was all cell grazing and all the rest, but just the, the wastage from the cows. Uh, this was feed that was just simply not being utilised. Uh, 2007, at the peak, peak of the millennium drought, due to an absence of suitable stock and domestic uh, water and additionally irrigation, we made the tough decision to close the dairy, close the dairy business and sell off all the stock. This forced our hand to increase our cropping and beef operations. 2009, uh, the SA government implemented a mains water supply for critical, uh, critical needs and stock and domestic access past our front gate. Uh, this then provided the opportunity to re-enter the dairy industry. Uh, this prompted our TMR, PMR plans to come into play. So we purchased a mixer wagon and built a feed pad made with a rubble base uh, with concrete uh, troughs down the middle. The milking of 150 cows had now commenced. Uh, within the next few years, irrigation returned, allowing us to grow a wider range of fodder and increase cow numbers. Our core focus then became homegrown feed for the support of the milking herd. Fast forward to 2014, and with numbers approaching about 450, we could see the need for a more permanent facility uh, due to wet winters and hot summers and the effects that these, both these extremes had on the cows and the feed quality. So after a heap of visits and phone calls to uh, David Altman's uh, barn set up, up the road, we engaged a US-based uh, dairy facility engineering group to create a design that was suitable for our location. Uh, additionally, we took this opportunity to upgrade our irrigation system to utilise the wastewater that was going to be coming out of this barn. So on the 10th of September 2016, we moved 600 cows into the new compost barn and continued, continued on two times a day milking to get a feel for the management of this new venture. One year later, and we uh, increased our milk, milking frequency to three times a day, feeding a total mixed ration of about 23 and a half kilograms of dry matter per cow. We currently employ nine staff to help cover the milking, feed based production and beef operations on farm. Now. Rightio, this is, yeah, barn, dairy, I can't point. Uh, that pad there next to that, ra that rainwater tank is now got four more rainwater tanks on it. Um, we'll be, hopefully by summertime, we'll be, uh, cows will be drinking rainwater because the, just to mitigate the, the water quality in the, in the lake, there's a lake out to the right. Uh, yeah, cows in the barn. <laughs> uh, yeah, just having to scoot across everything here. 
effluent ponds, all the rest there. So yeah, solid separator. Uh, double pond system, we pump the effluent from that big pond there that goes out through the irrigation. Now uh, we've selective, with, uh, with the automation of the pivots, we've able to um, pinpoint the weaker parts of the paddock and put the effluent out over them every time the pivot does a lap, it only starts the irrigation up on the, on the poorer parts. There's me in a very spray. So it's on one of the irrigation circles there. So we are the same. We don't contract a whole lot except chopping and carting and packing the stack when it comes to silage and, and reaping, sorry. So, but we, we spray seed and a lot of the hay stuff as well. There's some solid separated there gets on the, on the left-hand side there. So that's come off the solid separator and that'll get put onto the paddocks. Young stock just nailing a bit of tucker before we oversowed everything. And that's cutting some hay. So we've got butterfly mowers running around, cut all our own hay and silage. Bit of maize, that's a contractor, sorry, again. Yeah, the local mob putting the maize in. Some of the heavy ground there. And there's some shit being spread. <laughs> Must be it, eh? <laughs> Rightio, home growing feed. Uh, the farm's 5,500 acres. We get about 450 mils of rainfall, winter, winter dominant, with soil types comprising of sand over limestone and some heavier flats. Um, yeah, heavier ground is predominantly cereal cropped, achieving around five or six tonnes of, of grain to the hectare, or eight or nine tonnes of hay. Uh, on the heavier stuff and then on the poorer country, the lighter stuff, three or four tonnes of grain on the, on the lighter country. Uh, the lighter ground, some of the lighter ground at the back is, is renovated. We put that into buddy, into barley or whatever. Um, and that's just, done, that's just done to crop, to clean up, clean up weeds and go back to dry down loosen for the young stock. Uh, we grow about 50 or 60 hectares of maize every year. And yeah, aiming for that 20 to 23 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So when we double crop these pivots with either either a cereal for hay or cereal for grain, and the maize, yeah, we're pulling off north of 20 tonne of dry matter per hectare per year. Uh, yeah, we oversow the loosen as early as we can, which is very late this year because that was the only tucker we had. So all the young stock were, were on the irrigation for as long as we could, but we oversow it to clover, um, where we will traditionally get uh, two cuts of it's clover, loosen, dominant uh, silage under natural rainfall. Uh, and then irrigation after this, we get about four or five cuts of loosen, dominant silage normally. Uh, the silage is cut early to ensure high protein levels uh, with feed test pushing, well, aiming, aiming to f for feed test to push that sort of 30% uh, protein. Uh, we do bale some loosen hay, but are in the process of going to uh, an all silage ration uh, this year. Uh, we rely, well, we, we choose silage over hay due to the increased water use efficiency uh, and it can be cut, raked, chopped and under plastic in, uh, in three to four days as opposed to hay which can be out to ten days if the weather doesn't play the game. Uh, silage can also be scheduled uh, to be done on weekdays so us and the contractor can avoid unnecessarily, unnecessary weekend work. Uh, we cut and rake the loosen and then use out one of our trucks to help cart the silage uh, from the paddock to the stack. Um, but we work with the good people from Vanderbrink contract, uh, contracting to chop and run the stack. Uh, rightio. Cereal hay is also grown as part of the ration for renovation purposes as well, under the irrigation and on, on the dry land. Uh, straw is a byproduct from our cropping area, which is baled. We use some in our ration, some for bedding, and. Uh, opportunistic sales sell a bit, a bit as well if we get the chance. With our, and then with, the, with our assistance from our agronomist Matt Howe, I believe is in the crowd. Can you stand up, Matt? Where are you? Matt? Not going to stand up? Matt? There he is. I just want you to stand up. Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's from Platinum Ag Kurong at Meningi there. 
Uh, we regularly undertake soil and nutrient testing as well as effluent and compost testing for the gear that will spread on the irrigation that you saw earlier in the video. Uh, Fertiliser and nutrient applications are determined based on both feed volume as well as, ease, as feed volume removal, sorry, uh, as well as these soil tests. Uh, compost and effluent are applied at as high a rate as possible. We don't have the issue that New Zealand, that New Zealand has. We're going to be able to keep pouring it on and we're just going to keep pulling it off in, in, in feed and I can't see that we'll ever get to the problem that uh, yeah, New Zealand's facing there. So uh, yeah, we just keep, keep pouring it on and, keep, and just keep feed testing and monitoring it. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's just to increase that organic carbon and nutrient water holding levels in our soil by doing that. Uh, total homegrown feed equates to about 89% of our total mixed ration for the herd. So that's roughly, roughly what we got there uh, with our ration. Uh, with our nutritionist Vicky McDonald, we continue to, uh, to evolve and formulate our ration uh, as we are constantly wanting to improve on the year before, both in milk production and milk efficiency, uh, feed efficiency and conversion. Uh, based on our diet, our, the base of our diet consists mainly of maize, maize silage, cereal hay, and in addition, loosened hay, loosened silage, loosened clover silage, and homegrown barley. As I said earlier, 89% of the total feed intake uh, of the feed intake is homegrown, with just 11 brought in, mostly of, uh, con of concentrates and canola meal. So loosened silage, where on, on, a, on, an, on an average, any, any, any year normally, about 130 bucks for a dry matter tonne. Loose and haze, about 120 bucks a dry matter tonne. Maize silage, 130 bucks a dry matter tonne. Cereal hay, down to about 80 bucks a dry matter tonne. Straw is 60. Uh, barley grain, 100 bucks a tonne we roughly grow it for there anyway. So, yeah. That should, here we go. As previously mentioned, we run a split 600 uh, cow milking herd, host, mainly Holstein cows, on a 50 unit rotary. Uh, the rotary is a one person operation with a second person getting the cows in and working the compost. Per cow production is around 10,500 litres a year with a year round calving pattern. Herd one is our breeding herd, which is just about to finish in that video. Uh, and the AI is all done with automatic heat detection. Any cow on the, that the computer thinks uh, is on heat is drafted out in the AM milking only and AI'd. Herd two consists of all the pregnant cows. Ultrasounding is done at about 40 to 60 days after insemination. Uh, we seem to run at about 10% twin rate. So identifying the pregnant cows early uh, allows us to identify these cows and we just change the, change the uh, lead feed date to make sure they come in a little bit earlier. Uh, the biggest unexpected gain uh, from converting to the barn system in three times a day was an increase in fertility. So I can only really put that down to nutrition, nutrition and cow comfort, I guess. Um, cows are only bred using, uh, using AI on a corrective, corrective mating program. Sex semen is used fairly heavily in conjunction with Wagyu and beef straws uh, to keep our average straw cost down. We do this to minimise Holstein bull calves, but additionally all, all calves are raised and retained on farm, so no bobby calves, we raise them all on the farm and grow them out. Uh, Wagyu calves are raised and sold at about 12 months of age. Beef and Frisian steers are grown out to a finished product, and the beef fa females are sold to my brother, Reese for use in his beef enterprise. Um, Particularly in this current environment, we are able to minimise price risk as we, uh, as we have uh, the ability to grow fodder and value on farm production, value add on farm production. Uh, we farm in a relatively reliable rainfall area, uh, although it didn't rain for five months last summer, but we still managed to grow some, still managed to finish off some good crops, dryland crops last season anyway. Uh, wastage, uh, this allows this, this system has allowed us to have about, around 2% feed wastage in the barn with compared to our old feed pad system, which was around 12 to 15%. We also harvest around 95% of the feed from the paddock as opposed to around about 70, 75% at best with cows grazing in the paddock. Uh, each cow, whether she's the first back to the barn or the last one back to the barn, gets the same nutritional value from each mouthful of feed in the barn. Uh, we're also able to reduce the effects of extreme wet periods as well as hot spells. Each feed lane is rubber matted and we have misters above the feed lane that kick in on a thermostat. Uh, these things help drive intake as they, as they become extremely comfortable places to be on the warmer days. 
Spoilage of the ration from both heat and rain was an issue on the old rubble, feed, uh, rubble based feed pad. The barn maintains feed quality for the 24 hour period that the, the ration is in front of them. Uh, by controlling the ration, as well as controlling the environment, to a degree we're able to control costs and give ourselves a certain degree of business risk protection, which I didn't click on, final thoughts. Uh, in our changing climate and with the risk of having reduced water, our enterprise allows us to continue to provide quality feed within the system and therefore hopefully limiting the risk of having to close the dairy a second time. Uh, we try to ensure uh, we operate in a modern, well-managed TMR system, which I believe is far more efficient than what we could have achieved in our full TMR system, our full previous pasture-based system. Our TMR system has allowed for more control over the environment and animal feed intake. Uh, the system has assisted in better animal health and welfare due to cow comfort being a top priority. I would much rather, I would much prefer to be invest, investing in my own homegrown feed base rather than exposing our business to mobs like Castlegate James who are only interested in, interested in lining their own products selling over, overpriced byproducts at the expense of dairy farmers and in turn increasing business risk. Uh, we face challenges no different to what many others would be experiencing here today back on our farm, such as milk price or, or changing climate. But our business is purposely set up to minimise other challenges to ensure our business is sustainable in, sustainable in the future. Lastly, I'd like to thank the New South Wales Conference Symposium and sponsors for inviting me to speak with you today. Thank you so much, Brad. We do have time for a couple of questions. We've got two or three minutes for questions. Don't let me take, I've got two questions. Don't let me do it. Anyone? Yep, there's someone, I heard someone. Yes, at the back, and remember, name where you're from, please. Yeah, g'day, Andrew Smith, Moxie Farm, School of Gong. Brad, I'm just interested uh, primarily from the perspective you've heard what you think the next opportunity is for efficiency. For efficiency, uh, the dairy is underutilised. Like I said, we're only milking for, well, if you go start a few nine hours a day. So push numbers, push numbers, I guess. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be the next place. The barn's sort of doing its thing. Um, yeah, I'd be putting fans in if I could afford them at the moment, just to, just to get rid of that. We're, we're only can't half from the ocean, so we get a lot of cool breezes, damp breezes, so as soon as the compost gets gets drier than the atmosphere, it pulls the moisture out of, out, out, of the, out of the breeze. So fans would help keep that moving. But yeah, the dairy, I guess, is, is a second barn and another 300 to 600 cows to go through that. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? I've got, a, I've got one for you, Brad. From the flyover video, it seemed like there was a lot going on. Around timing of operations in, in your business, can you give us a bit of an idea about how you manage all these, the different things and getting the timing right and stuff? Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. It's just keeping all the balls in the air at once. That's, yeah, you just have to. I don't, I don't have an answer to it. It's running around like a headless truck some days. And then, um, yeah, I, I, we, got, we do have excellent staff. I've got, I've got a young fellow that works for me uh, on, the, on the cropping side and, and on, he helps me with the maintenance as well. And, He's out seeding today, just doing, running the last of the barley out into a couple of paddocks, over on some paddocks, and he does what he has to do, and as long as I'll keep in front of him on the boom spray, he doesn't bother me and I don't bother him. But our dairy staff, we've got, I've got three or four good seniors. The ladies look after, a couple of ladies that look after the calf rearing, and they do what they've got to do, and they ring me if they need me. It's pretty much the long and short of it is, is just trying to keep it all happening, and, and they're training guys up as well, guys and girls, the, the staff training them and getting procedures in place is a, is a big part of it. One more question, yeah, there's one uh, here, thank you. Debbie Platts, I'm a local dairy farmer. You sort of just answered a little bit then anyway, but I was looking to inquire, we, we obviously found out you've got an, an agronomist that helps you out and it's probably gonna cost you a beer later, but um, what other consultants and, and advisors does your business use? Uh, we've got nutritionists, obviously mentioned Vicky, Vicky earlier. Uh, in regards to that, I wouldn't say I have any other people that I call on in, in, a, in, a, in a professional sense, but yeah, if the, the, key, the key to what I think that I've done, and Marcus Oldham helped a lot, uh, was, was networking. 
it's just, just if I don't know the answer, I need someone in my phone that does. Yeah, and it's not Siri, it's, but he, uh, it's <laughs> you should, mates, mates, mates and mates and, and, and people in the industry. Yeah, and, and don't, don't be afraid to ask a stupid question if you want the answer. Yeah. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Brett.